Okay, now for our main speaker. This is Lester P. Singleton. He is an award-winning educator. He's a community organizer, an artist. What else we got? Activist. You are all over. I love it. Do a little bit of this and, and a little bit amen. of that. <laughs> so we I'm do. <laughs> You've had time. You've had time. Uh, yeah, I've had some time. Um, so we've got questions. Some are, uh, I'll be reading to you. Some Andrew will be putting out into the audience. If I may, before Absolutely. we begin. Um, as many times as I do this, I'm terrified every time I get up to do it. I feel a great weight on my shoulder to share the words and try and bring the, the light like I do. So in order to center myself for that, I like to first ask that, um, are there any uh, indigenous uh, to Ohio folks in this room? Okay. Um, I will begin then and say, I want to give honor to the ancients and to the indigenous forces and powers and creative souls who were here way before us. And recognize that everywhere we step here, we are on stolen and misreappropriated land and power and energy. And I like to always uh, give honor um, to whatever those energies were that bring me here today. I am a person of faith, so I always have to ask that my higher power, God, come and be with me and allow me to be open enough to hear you all and for you to hear me. And with that, we can move. And thank you, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so our first question is, what is empowering about being black and trans? Good. <laughs> what isn't empowering? I mean, what isn't, uh, it, it's an interesting question because what is empowering really the question about being you? You know, what is empowering for me about being black is just, I mean, the cadence of it all, the pride of it all, the fact that we are um, direct descendants of the motherland, of the first woman to give birth to the world. How can that not be empowering? How can it not be empowering to know what atrocities, what ways, have, what has been done? Statues smashed, people killed, written word and visual word destroyed to make me feel like I shouldn't be proud and yet can't even hold it back. You can't even hold it back. It's the cadence, it's the walk, it's the, it's the, it's the what I can't even explain um, to you. And I don't know about being uh, trans. I am a person, I did not, uh, well, I have a transition. I emerged. I don't think of it as a transition. I, I don't begrudge anyone. Some people, that's their journey. But me, I've been this way since before I ever breathed air on this earth. I have been this way, but I've just been closed. So I am emer emerging, and what is beautiful about that is I just feel like I'm more light, more shine, more I can, uh, I'm, not so, it's hard for me to stay closed in. There's more about myself. I, I started physically, um, and by that I mean um, taking uh, drugs to change the way my body is, doing body augmentation, only like four years ago. I have always been a person that has lived very much in the in-between. I don't really, I believe most people are closer to the center. And that the trick has been to pull us away from the center and push us out here where it's unnatural. To me, transgender people, non-binary people, do not sit on the outskirts. That's the foolery. That's the tomfoolery. We're right here and everything else is pushed out here, but that's the only way that you can do power and control 
right, is if you can get people to believe that themselves is not enough, that what they are isn't the, a beautiful creation of God, a beautiful creation of the first explosion of life on earth. That is how we get separated and pushed away is by trying to set us in, you know yourself, that there are very few people that are completely masculine and macho or completely, that dude cooks, that, that, that female changes her tire, wh whatever it is, there are very few people, and that comes with a certain amount of privilege if you are living that way, right? It's a certain amount of privilege if you are able to live that completely way that it says that a man or a woman is supposed to be. That's a huge privilege that most people die trying to get to. And so, I don't know, that's my answer on that. I love it. <laughs> Y'all don't have to clap. <laughs> and then we have a question from Oliver, who is a uh, member of our Sociology of Gender and Sexuality class. Hi. Um, I, just, I guess I wondered what most inspires you in your life, in your activism, in your art. Well, I am from Zanesville, Ohio. That is, if you don't know, that is southeastern Ohio right before you cross the border into Pennsylvania, down on the river. And I'm not even from the town, I am country. I am, uh, <laughs> another thing that I have just started claiming in the last 10 years is I am hillbilly, I am Appalachian. I am from out there running in the mud, running in the woods. I worked very hard to, when I uh, came to college, to, I can always tell if somebody's from Zanesville. I can hear it, it I can hear it in the way they say home, or y'all come on up here, the way that they will say that. But I worked very hard, because that is another barrier. The minute that people think you're from the country, and, and not even worse, not even the town, you're from the country, you're from the fields, they start Xing you out. They start thinking about who you aren't, who you aren't, or who you who you're not going to be. And so, like just being there, um, Zanesville it was a very, very openly racist place to grow up. The Ku Klux Klan was proud and present in our government in every part of what was happening in Zanesville. At the same time, we had a strong, vibrant black community of which my family, um, my father, on my father's side, uh, the main AME church there, I was probably 40, year old, 40 years old before someone who wasn't blood related to me ran that church and was in the leadership of that church. My great grandfather, my great grandfather was the founder, uh, a co founder, a junior co founder of the main Baptist church in our town. So, like, that was where our lives were. They were all involved. My, my great grandmother was a SNCC organizer. They were all involved in anything that promoted education, that promoted black folks. They stood up and did it. So from no age, I saw that. From no age, I saw the organizing. From no age, I was getting on buses with my grandmother to come up to Columbus so that they could speak before the state and things like that. So I, I, it was already kind of there. And I just have this personality. I just have this personality that cannot stand to see people be mistreated. I don't care who it is. So like when I was nine, I got myself together and I raised around $2,000 for, um, for um, March of Dimes all by myself you know, because it just hurt my heart to see it. So that is just there. And then 
being the type of person I've known, I knew that I was something other than straight. <laughs> this is something. <laughs> I didn't have a word for it. I knew I was something other than that. I would say I was five or six. It was very clear to me when I was eight that I wasn't like, I am born female, um, raised female, but there's never, I always thought something was wrong with that. I always thought that it didn't quite make sense. I would scour, I was a very precocious and well-read child. It was easy to hide in the library. And at that time, I'm really dating myself, there were these cards that you went oh, yeah. through. I remember them. <laughs> you went through these cards <laughs> like this, and you find a word, and then you read that and go to the book, and then you try to like look up where that word would appear somewhere else, and you'd go, and you would hope, because that librarian you just knew, knew every single section of those cards. So, you know, it, I, I, it, it, was, it was in my mind and I was trying to find out who I was. I just didn't have any work. Now I knew at church, Mr. Williams and Mr. I can't remember his name, were good friends. They were deacons. They were highly regarded. They always came in separate cars, but they ended up at the same house. They were always together. While there was a whisper, it wasn't that loud, but they were together. There were all these gay, people in our church, but I didn't know how to access them, but they were also the leaders of the activism that happened in the church. That long-winded answer was to that. So it's always been around me to fight. It's always been around me. So it just come, comes natural, and I decided the first time I ever walked in pride that I didn't want anybody to have to go through what I went through. The lying, the sneaking, the being quiet, the being lonely and sad, the making mistakes and decisions to try and be what I wasn't. I have, I, I have a son um, that I gave up for adoption before I went to college, right before I went to college, because I was trying to be this thing everybody said I want to be. And you see all these things all. So then what did that do? That made me a statistic, right? So now I'm an unwed young black woman, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with a child out of wedlock, and they just pile and pile. So my experience of that made me fight because it was hard to find help and hard to stay in school and hard for, all folks my age, like you, treated me like a pariah because I probably was like a reminder of what could happen. So all of those types of things are what makes me fight. It, I was born in 61, you know? I'm in my 20s, what, in the early 80s. I, my high schools are through the 70s. I mean, how could I not? You have to bury your head to not feel the passion and the movement and be moved to do something. Excellent. Uh, and then our next question is from Abigail. Um, and would you like to read it? Okay, I have to ask you to oh, yeah. speak up. <laughs> Yes, I can't hear you better. Um, I think a lot of younger queer people have put their emphasis towards youth to urban spaces, like in Lincoln and stuff. Um, did you always know that you wanted to stay in the youth community in Ohio? Um, or don't most people need to know that? <laughs> <laughs> she said, 
Um, a lot of queer people look to moving to more urban settings, New York, oh. LA. Did you always know that you wanted to be here in Ohio in your... Oh, I did not want to be here in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> no, honey, no. I used to stand in uh, Zanesville, there's the Y Bridge. Um, the Ohio, uh, the uh, Muskingum and the Licking come together and dump into the Ohio. And at its center point, at the confluence right there, I would stand there and look at that Ohio and just have myself Tom Sawyer moments and Huckleberry <laughs> Finn. And that. You know, I would just think about, because we had a canoe, um, and I would just think about trying to get out of there because it just felt like a wet blanket. Uh, I never had the idea that I would, I am surprised by the fact that I did not come back and have just started coming back home. I'm, I am surprised by that. I always thought I would leave and try to bring the light back, but I knew that I would not be able to survive. I knew, you know, I uh, honestly, I was a seasoned drinker by the time I was nine and a half, 10 years old. Damn. I was a seasoned drinker and still carried a four point. You know, I put all these pressures on myself, but to numb the, the pain, those are things that are really just coming back. I would have before said, well, in high school, I was, you know, every morning I would go and have a, have a, a few, a couple cocktails before the day started. Lunch, because I had hall pass and because I always volunteered to be student council, be this, be that. That gives you a lot of leeway to wander the halls. I was a good kid, I didn't date anybody, but I had a, a drinking problem. I, I had a drinking problem. And so I would like just, I knew that if I didn't get out of there, it would kill me. I, I knew that. So I always had the idea to go. Um, I wanted to go west. I mean, for us, everything was happening on the coast. And I, my aunt lived in New York. I'd been to New York a few times. It wasn't really my speed. And I was like kind of a hippie kid, which was unusual for black folks where I'm from. So I loved the earth. I wanted to go to the beach. I wanted to do all of that. And San Francisco was out there. Mm -hmm. Oakland was out there. So I got myself a full ride to Stanford. But my uh, father, did not understand what that meant. For him, Ohio State was the goal. And so, and for me, I didn't realize that I would be 18 that fall and that I didn't have to listen to them. I, I, I didn't realize that. And then I got pregnant. So what was I gonna do? What was I gonna do? I mean, I did muster it together and uh, I, I was devastated to come to Ohio State. I felt like it was going to be full of the same kind of boneheads that I grew up with. I, I felt like I wasn't going to get pushed right. to do the things that I wanted to do. I was devastated, but I also uh, was not going to stay in Zanesville. So I took those <laughs> scholarships and grants and things that I got. I went to Ohio, Ohio State, five months pregnant, and lived in the towers there. Um, and I did that, gave up my kid, and I still had in my mind, I thought I was gonna go to London and maybe do study abroad or something like that. I always had in my mind I wanted to go places, and I wanted to learn things, and I wanted to bring it back. I, I would, when I would go home, I would talk to my cousins about what I did. Any chance I got to go somewhere, I would go. It would, I would go even if I would, had to be stuffed in the back of the seat <laughs> with everybody's luggage, I would go. Because A, I was a slow, low tra traveler, and everyone always needs a driver. And so that, that's what I would do. What I learned, though, what I will learn, and this might, what I learned, and this might be shocking, the closeness and the tight knitness of 80s, 90s, the aughts, queer Columbus 
was better than anything you could find in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, et cetera, et cetera, when it came to community. When it really came to community and folks doing stuff, and often when I would go to those places, those people would be from Ohio or from the Midwest because our desire to create and to organize, it is born in this fire and we go someplace, the only problem here is we have to fight to try and have it happen. And so many of us believe that it's not possible, we can't find the community to help us grow this. But if you go to the cities, they're already there popping and doing it. So it is easy to find people to do that, but then sometimes that life be burning you out because you miss the community and the homeness and the whatever it is here in Ohio. So I like I have driven back and forth twice. I recommend everybody do that. Get in a car and drive across this United States and you will learn some things that will change your mind about this world, about this place that you live in. And you will see that it ain't so shiny all the time where it's shiny. And so that would be my answer. The urban centers, um, I did not find, I mean, I might find a, a good club. Now, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> the clubs is good, the food is good. Um, but the, the opportunity to build uh, a kind of community that's familial um, is, Non-plus here, it's, you can't explain it. You cannot explain it. Excellent. This is a question that you've kind of touched on already. What experiences inspired you to be who you are now? Kind of gone over, the, if you have anything else there to add, are, great. <laughs> so, I can remember something distinctly, and that is when, um, Martin Luther King is shot in what? History buffs. Six, what is it? Anybody? Google? What was it? It was like 67, 68, right? Yeah, 67, 68. We were, we had moved to Pennsylvania. I grew up in Zanesville around eight years old. We moved to Sharon, Pennsylvania. Um, we went, we'd always come back to Zanesville to visit my grandmother and my great grandmother. Um, I was also pretty much raised, we spent an enormous amount of time with my mother's grandmother, my great grandmother, and that house was all women, all cisgendered, strong black women. So I accredit that to it. And my great grandmother was a manly woman. <laughs> I mean, she, I think Big Mama was a, a good 5'9", five, 5'10", five, uh, had done a lot of field work in her day. I can remember her hands were, I have her hands, her hands were these, just like these massive hands, and she had kind of a deep voice in her presence. Just everybody paid, it, paid attention, and we are mostly raised there, she saw me too. And she used to say to me that times would be hard, just keep my faith and believe that she saw me and believe who, who I was. She never said the word, I think you're a big old um, dyke or you know, you're a little fancy pants there or I don't know what's going on with you. She never said that. But when we would do, I, I do dishes to this day and think about her. That is how I'll calm down. I will get that water as hot as I can and start doing those dishes. And she just, I just remember, so she meant a lot, a lot to me. And she was the family storyteller too. And she made us proud of who we were and how we had participated. And she would walk us like ducks every day. She walked downtown to do her bills uh, every single day. 
I don't know why she couldn't pay him in advance. We often <laughs> ask that. Or why we had to walk downtown. But it was also a source of pride for her. It was her town. I mean, we would be greased up together, buttoned up, and walking like a mile and a half to downtown, <laughs> sit outside the courthouse, let her do her business. What I didn't know is that she was also going and filing complaints. She was going and asking for things in the neighborhood. I didn't know that until way, I didn't know that until way le later. And so seeing her sort of run yeah. things and then 67, 68, we come in to visit her and my grandmother is standing, is sitting on an ottoman in front of the television and my great grandmother is going, Lord mercy, Lord mercy. We walk in the door and my grandmother just turns around and said, they killed him. I told you they were going to do that. They killed him. They killed him. They told you. And we were just shuffled into the drawing room and they pulled the thing. We didn't even know who had got killed until later because there was such a flurry. I wanted to be a part of that action. I wanted to be like that was a motivator for me. You fast forward to Matthew Shepard being killed. I, prior to that, three black women whose names escaped me, the 70s were really good sometimes in my memory. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, maybe the 2000s. Um, but um, there were three black trans women that had been killed in Cleveland, Ohio. Not a blip. It barely made the, I mean, barely made it. You had to look for it in the newspaper. And Charlie, oh, what is his name? No, James Byrd Jr. James Byrd Jr. was a black man who um, was rumored to be a little sweet in the pants. That's how they put it in the paper. It was rumored to be a little sweet in the pants. And these three white men decided he could be lured with liquor and decided to invite James to go for a ride. And the next time we know about James, he's in several pieces mm -hmm. down the road. And there was a question about whether that was a hate crime. In that moment, I decided that there was nothing else I could do. I wasn't even identifying as a transgender person then. I just wouldn't answer the question. I was peripherally involved in organizing. I was the person who thought to bring the water, to bring the this, to bring the snacks, to bring all of that. I wasn't really leading the charge or really trying to create things to shake things up. And in that moment, there was nothing left. It took me back to when I was, I would have been seven or eight, and then this thing happened. And I don't begrudge the movement around Matthew Shepard. I don't begrudge it. I have benefited. My life has benefited. Other people have benefited by that work. But I was enraged and continue to be enraged by the black and brown queer bodies that are left like stones to be walked on that uh, around. I've been enraged by it and it, I can't be quiet. I cannot. A long time ago, someone did, uh, I, had, I had an actual indigenous <laughs> friend who actually was um, practicing to carry on for her for her family as a shaman. And she did a ceremony with me in which spirit animals were used. And one of mine is the hawk. And if you know anything about a hawk, what a hawk will do, it tells everybody everything that's going on. The hawk is just flying like this going, mm, mm. And if there's something especially danger that way, the hawk is like, watch out! Watch out, everybody, watch out. Danger is coming, look up. That is me. I'm just trying to show the light, crack open the door, let people know, and be inspired to do something about it.
I don't know where I started there. Was there I've probably been coming out all my life at something or another, <laughs> you know, um, and, and that, that really is the truth. I mean, I used to, to, I mean, I have to admit it, I would say hi. Yeah, I could talk around it and say, oh, I didn't talk about this or the other. But when I first decided, I, I started out, I guess, as a lesbian. But what I would say is, I was a lesbian politically. That's what I would say. I could hold to the, the, you know, the feministic part of it and all of that. And yeah, them girls was all right. Um, but it never felt quite right for me because I had to still learn how I wanted people to interact with me. And how, and I'm not a butch. I am not a butch, maybe a butch fit, but I am not, I am not. A, a, a butch, so that never quite worked there. So I um, would sort of had to come out as not butch and have to deal with people having a problem with that. I, I didn't tell people that I was a child of God, a, a child of God, ever. I didn't say that. I had church for myself on Sunday. If I had a partner, they would know about that, but I would even set and either move away from the conversation or I would say things like, oh, I don't know if everybody feels that way. If somebody was having an a, a, a anti-faith, I understood it, I could allow it, and I didn't feel like that was the sword that I wanted to fall on because I was already distant. So I had to come out as that. I had to come out uh, at Ohio State. I became uh, the director of Ethnic Student Services. I was the first out black something, GLBT person um, for the university. Out, like in the way that when I walked in the room, everybody already knew it. That was a coming out I didn't even know I was going to have to do because I had already been the coordinator of GLBT student services. So who would think that I would have to do this coming out again, but my uh, black and brown um, um, colleagues were like, you might want to tone that down. You might want to, you know, that's how it was. So there was a coming out there. There was a coming out in my trans experience because I am neither, uh, I say that I am a uh, mask of sinner now. I'm comfortable with that. I'm a non-binary person, mask of sinner. I, I, for simple purposes, I identify as transgender. Plus, 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 plus. <laughs> but I, you're constantly coming out. I now work for, uh, I left Equitas Health um, uh, the last six years. I've been uh, managing a drop-in center for uh, trans folk, uh, folks of color for uh, the last six years, I just left that and going to do ministry outreach for a church, a new church start in my black neighborhood, which is something that I have wanted to do. I wanted to walk to church, I wanted to walk to my job, and I wanted to work in the neighborhood I live. Uh, the neighborhood I live, from the moment that I moved there, people are like, why are you moving there? You make good money, why, why would you live there? Because that's where the people are. And that's where the vibrance is. And nobody has a barbecue like they do on my street. <laughs> you know, like uh, all of those types of things. But it's, I think you continually come out. You're always coming out. You know, I know people who are like, uh, who, who I, I, I don't even know what I wanna say. I, I know people that, well, just now with this, now people have seen me, but I have people going, so are you a dude now? You're a dude now? I've always identified myself as a dude. I'm a dude. Like, I am. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dude. And whatever that means, like, that's what I am. And I would always refer. And they're like, we're sorry. My le I was very active in the lesbian feminist community. Very active. 
I got people telling me they're sorry that they're losing me. Can you believe that? Like, I'm like losing me. Where, where am I going? Right. Where am I going? It's connected to my surgery. You know, I had chest surgery. Somehow, I was like, didn't we fight for this in the 70s for boobs not to be a thing connected to who you are? Didn't we fight for this? I don't understand. Didn't lesbians tell me that it was okay for me to be how I'm supposed to be? Didn't they tell me that? Why is that? Why do my, my gay brothers insist on talking about my genitalia and what I have and what I don't have and whether that classifies me as a real man. I'm here to tell you, I'm not trying to be a real man. I'm a dude and this is who I am. I'm a trans man. Get over it. What do you care at all? I, I don't know how it would affect you at all. Same brain, same brain, same voice, same, well, it's a little bit deeper. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the funny thing around that is I had a very deep voice growing up and I used to get physically redirected to talk on, I can't even do it now, but I used to talk on top of my voice so that it would be like this and I would get in trouble for talking to people. But what else does that do? It makes you smaller, mm -hmm. makes you tinier. They was just trying to put out my light. They were. That's why my name is Luster, shiny. Put a shine on all of it. <laughs> nice, I like it. <laughs> I like that. Um, how has your life changed since transitioning? What's the, been the best change and the worst change? The day that I, I had been thinking about it uh, for a while, but I am deathly afraid of needles. I mean, deathly afraid. And the shot that I take once a week is always drama. Like, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's been almost two years now. Sometimes I have to have somebody else do it. I'm not even gonna lie. Like, it's always drama. Um, but the, re the thing that uh, catapulted me into making the decision that I didn't care if I had to cry an hour or not, that I was going to do this because I wanted these recognizable changes. I wanted to see in the mirror for real. I wanted people for real to see what I saw in the mirror. Like what I see in the mirror is what I've been seeing in the mirror, Dang, you know? But I, want, I wanted that. My good friend, um, um, Oh, yeah, my good friend. Now I can't remember his name. <laughs> 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 Damn it. Um, Ruben uh, Carrera, he dropped dead in his garden after some organizing we did. I can't tell you what was about. And he is about six years younger than me. The, when I heard it, a uh, friend texted me and then said, pull over, pull over, and I said, what is it, who is it? You know, people don't tell you to stop and pull over unless it's some really bad news, usually. I was like, who is it? And she's like, it is the car off. Yeah, yeah, the car is off, like, who is it? And she told me, the very next thought I had is I'm starting um, I'm starting to. Very, not, not, oh my God, what happened? Oh my God, where are you? Nothing. That was the very next thought that I had. And then I don't remember anything after that, but that ne a week later, I was in the office saying, let's, I'm ready, let's do this thing. I don't know if it became real for me, just how temporary life is. Um, I have... As a, as a queer person out there mentoring and educating, I, I've lost more than my share of, of people. I've had a lot of people die. A lot of people decide that they wanted to leave earlier than I wish that they would have. But there was something about this that, so I would say, I, I you know, I, I was also, what was, I was like 59, I think, 
I guess that would have been right. And I thought, how ridiculous is it that I'm sitting and waiting for my parents and my great uncles and uncles and aunts to die before I live who I really am. When I'm saying to these kids every day, when I'm saying to these people every day, you're a fraud. I'm saying that to me. When I'm saying to all of you, live your life, be who you are, take a chance, there I was blaming it on a needle and still not living my truth. So my life has been more open. It's been, it was a weight off. When I said those words, a weight just went off of my shoulders. I felt lighter. I felt my great grandmother's spirit be like, finally. You know, I, I had put, you know, you'll put it because of fear, you'll put conditions on things and that people are going to do that you don't even know. We don't give folks credit for loving us either. We don't give folks credit to have an emotion and be able to then get past that emotion. We want to try and control everything. So that, like, it just has made me more open and more um, vulnerable. What has sucked about it is losing the people that I have lost because of it. That, that has sucked. Uh, one of my religious leaders, the person who actually got me to praying aloud again, cannot. Refuses to call me my name, refuses to use my pronouns. And I would say, um, really, really, I've, it's never been that big of a, a huge deal for me. I'm going to respect you and yours, but I, I don't care because, you know, I'm a little bit pretty and I'm a little bit... Mm. So, you know what, no, no matter how the light shines, who knows what you'll see. I've spent a great deal of my life performing as a drag queen, you know, especially in the 90s. So, and that was the most, she's the most high femme thing you ever saw in, in your life. And so, um, people used to ask me if I was a man or a woman. And it was, I get delight out of that, you know, because it takes the mystery away from all of it, it makes it more accessible. But it has been painful, she, she can't do it. And she saw me evolve in this and she cannot do it. That hurts. It has hurt to have to say, I'm actually getting ready as I'm leaving Equitat to finally say to people, because I didn't do a big thing. I didn't take a whole bunch of pictures. I didn't show people every day. I just sort of, I didn't expect that. I do love a live um, Instagram live or Facebook live. I do love that. But I didn't do that with this. I got way quieter than I imagined that I would. So that's another thing is my quiet. Quiet, I think, was a good thing. You need to get quiet sometimes. You need to, like, just shut up and kind of listen and let the trust that the world has got you or the, that, um, the energy of the world has got you and carry you on. But I think that it got me ready to like finally say, you know, I didn't think I was going to have to do this. But y'all going to have to get my name right and my pronouns right or we, we just not going to be able to hang out, okay? I don't care. Yes, I was a Girl Scout. I'm proud that I was a Girl Scout. I was a Girl Scout until a sophomore year in college. Thank you very much. <laughs> those of you who came behind me, those better uniforms. Yours truly, <laughs> you know, I, I like the, all, of, all of these types of things, you know, I, um, but I still, that has been the, the saddest part that the people closest to me have been the, the most resistant. Not me. Um, the thing, I, uh, it's like so cliche to say, but the, the thing I really wish I knew is that I was okay, just how I was. I just wish somebody would have just kept telling me that, that the, in those words, you, how you are, are okay. And that it's gonna ebb and flow. 
And you do not have to be, you may be this, but down the road, you might be this. A little bit further, you might be this, and then you might come back to this. And all of that is okay. It, it really is. Like that is it, and that most people are fronting with the hard words and all of that. Most people, that's their own insecurity coming out. And if you can, uh, I, I would also say just practice responses. You know, because that's what catches you off. But if it, I was, I, I actually am a person, I will practice response, especially my family has a huge family reunion and people like to get ridiculous and act stupid. And so I will think of those things that have caught me before. And like, girl, I heard you was gay. And I'm like, first of all, um, if that's not with a U, you, you're gonna have to rethink the word. And second of all, that is so old. You didn't know that? <laughs> I mean, we went to high school. To, and, and it sounds crazy, but you will feel empowered and you could walk on. Because a lot of times people are like, oh my God, I wish I would have said it. Say it be like, for real? And sometimes you need to get a little loud with it. I do not believe you just asked me if I'm gay. <laughs> and go, and it, you will, other people that are looking out for you will come and handle that and come and take care of that. You know, like I, like I know it sounds crazy, but some of your biggest haters might come around may come around because you've grabbed your own pride and been like, well, regardless, I guess you just ain't in my truth. You know, I, I guess you just ain't in my house. I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew, <laughs> I knew it. Uh, anyhow, that's what I would say, like really as much as you can, Tell people even if you, it doesn't even make sense. If it comes on your heart to tell somebody that they are good, to tell somebody that they are not just worth it, that there's value, you should do that. It, it'll get easier every time you do it. It'll get easier, but that's what people need. That's what we need. It's just to be reminded you're born uh, from, from me, in my mind, you're born in glory. You're born perfect. That's it. Like you're born full of light and energy. Don't let anybody dim that. They're out there trying to dim it or you'll be old like me. You know, trying to get people. I want you to know this now. So maybe we don't really even have to have no conversations like this by the time you are how you are. That is my wish and my, and my goal. I, I, I would like us to learn this history and, and all of these things. And for those of you from Ohio, stop letting people treat you like we aren't powerful. It is called the heart of it all because we are the heart of us all. I challenge you to go to anything great that has happened in this nation of ours. And I am a patriot. Sorry, y'all. Sorry out there. God bless America. I sing the songs. I know how we mess up. And I also believe in the community and land that we are from. I challenge you to go to anything significant that has happened in these United States and its territories um, and not find an Ohioan there who's done something. I challenge you that. In your history, we're all over it, all over it. People of color, queer folks, all of us, we're all over it. Disabilities, leaders in disability education and disability um, um, rights and politics. That's what I would say to remind yourself that you already, just by birthright, are part of something great. Thank you. I like it. Okay. Hi. Um, so, yeah, my question was, are you doing anything in particular to celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility at the end of the month or any mm. thing you want to turn us on to? Um, this year, last year was pretty big. Um, this year, I have not decided what I'm doing, to be quite honest. Um, 
I may just be getting with a group of friends and going to do something and be invisible. Every day is Trans Visibility Day for me. <laughs> Every single solitary day. You know, but I, I have, I will admit, with the legislation and stuff going on um, here in Ohio, like, it's been a little, I have caught myself, um, I have a uh, transgender key thing, you know, and it's all long, lanyard, it's all long, and I'll be wearing that just because I love, I just love to see people be like, <laughs> you know, and so that there's other people out there that like I was when I didn't know anybody and that they can see me. But I have been lately balling it up and putting it in my pocket. That has given me pause, uh, especially when I'm by myself. And especially when I did it today when I came onto campus, when I got out. And I'm coming to this and I still, I'm like, I'm in the deep woods of Ohio, you know? Like, like Akron was a scary place when I was growing up to come up here after dark now to certain areas that we had to cross through in order to get. I'm, that's no lie. You know, that's not even 100 years ago, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, a scary place, so muscle memory will do things. You know, I scanned the car to see what was laying out. Muscle memory will um, do that to you. So I'm not, re I'm not really, but who knows, maybe somebody's doing something that I'll want to go and support. I'm usually planning something uh, with Mosaic. We're usually putting on some kind of thing. And this year, uh, this year I have not. Um, I meant to, uh, I did share it uh, with you all. Maybe you can share it with everyone else. I'm also going to be like posting things up about, I don't know if you all have seen the recent map of the U.S. with um, drag bands, current drag bands. You know, I think there's only like 14 states that don't have pending drag bands. And, you know, folks are like, well, who cares? I don't even go to a drag show. Why do I care about that? Well, it's just like everything else. We're going to start there. So that means there's no public cross-dressing. And that cross-dressing can be, you should see the list of things that are on there. Like, it doesn't mean, it's like, dangly earrings and things on men. Like you, it, I mean, that is happening. Right here in our state, trans youth are not gonna be able to play sports. It's the most ignorant thing I've ever heard in my life. Yet the people we've elected, for whatever reason, the educational board thinks that's okay. Somehow in our new schools, we can't build single stall bathrooms. You know, I mean, let's just think about that. Whose idea was it anyway to have everybody piled up in a bathroom if you are really worried about homosexuality? I mean, like, mm -hmm. like, like, honestly, honestly, if we, or you don't have a communal bathroom at your home, like, not like that, you know, why would you, if you are worried about people being homosexuals, why would you have everybody grouped up in a bathroom, same gender? I mean, we know that's ridiculous. That's not how that happens. <laughs> but I'm just saying, and now they're fighting against having a single, single stall bathrooms. Doesn't make any sense in our state of Ohio. And what do we do? Oh, roll our eyes. We're going to get out of here. It's not going to matter. Well, it just closes in and closes in and more and more. You're not going to be able to run anywhere. You know, you can walk into a bar strapping your gun. What kind of sense does that make? But I can't smoke a bowl on my back porch. <laughs> it, it, it's ridiculous. It, it really is ridiculous. And so, you know, I'll probably have some outbursts like that. <laughs> do some live <laughs> outbursts like that and just say, you know, why we're having visibility day. Like, like. Lordy, it, every day needs to be the visibilities of whatever it is. Right on. Yep, I agree. Yeah, we've actually got another question from Bruce. More questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all. What do you have for college students who are wanting to get more involved in activism and community organizing? 
So one of the things that I really like to impress upon people is everybody wants to go for that big march, those big things. Do what's within your realm to be able to do. Invite your friends over for whatever it is y'all eat, ramen, pho, you know, cauliflower crust pizza, you know, whatever it wings, whatever it is, <laughs> invite them over and put on, put on a video, put on a film and be like, look, let's watch this. That is activism. Maybe you read something and get them like, really, that is activism. You just speaking up when you see people and letting them know that you're there, you hear something whack. Look, you believe however you want to believe, but please don't be saying that around me. It's that simple. And then you can get up and go too. You can get up and go and just be like, I'm not going to be a part of it. There's enough hate. It's like the jokes. It's the things that you watch on TikTok. It's the things that come across Twitter that you think is just a little joke and not that big a deal, but that's being ingrained in you. And, to, and it's desensitizing you so that when it's actually happening in front of your face, you're paralyzed to do anything about it. Whether you're feeling guilty because you was just laughing about that, or whether you're like, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal. That little hurt on that person, who cares? You know, then people at Walmart are funny. It's that type of thing. It really is. And if you don't have a, a balance with it, it is choosing a topic in your classes that's going to push people a little bit, committing to that topic and doing it. That's enough. Anything that you do is enough that pushes against the grain. You don't have to organize people to stand outside in the cold, in their boots, and waving a placard. You can volunteer. You, you can tell people about, you all just learn about this organization right here. You can bring it upon yourself to post something up for them because you don't know. You don't know who's a friend of a friend who might need this service. You could just do that if we normalize it. And by that means, oh, well, I'm not a black gay man. I'm not living with HIV, so I'm not going to post this. Which, by the way, 18 to 24, you all, something you should worry about, something that you should know. If you don't know your status, I don't care. You're part of the problem. If you don't know your status, if your dingbat friends don't know their status, everybody's out there wiling out. This is my public service announcement. Um, everybody's out there wiling out. And I, last I knew, it was like 44%. 44%, 18 to 24 year olds, don't even know that they have contracted the virus. Don't even know. Syphilis in Ohio is insane. Yes, yes, yep. Insane, and you can live with that. And it'll pop up way down the road. You done infected all these people along the way, including your loved one, and you just found out that you had this because we don't normalize testing. We don't get people up here together on PrEP. HIV should be just a thing we're managing that people have. We, they're, they're, we can completely control it and we won't. Yes, sir? You know, uh, can I say something? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sitting here listening to you and sometimes you remind me of me because I'm older than you. So, I know. And, and I'm like, I'm I have heard you speak before, way back. Yeah, when. we've been on a panel. Yeah, we've been. And I, I sit here to hear this, and when I think about transgender murders, Akron has had our share. Oh my goodness. And no one talks about them whatsoever. No. When the young man Jalen Walker got shot, they were in the streets. Yeah. And I sympathize with that. Yeah. But being the activist I am for my stage, you know, loving black folk. I need to know, what about these people? Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. And I keep saying, what about these people? Mm -hmm. I tell our, we have our community dinners for all people. And we serve people 18 to 24, that's our target. Mm -hmm. And we have transgenders, we have teens, they come in there. And I say, you got to vote. Oh, I don't really have to vote. 
escaped it. And they and you made it so simple about I think they hear me talk my voice like there go Mr. Steve again. So they're they're immune to my comments. You know, it, he, that's it happens. I just see the eyes glass over. Yeah. You know, I see the eyes glass over. And I, I, all I can say is the way that it's happening is because we've sat and let it happen. We let it happen. We have let it happen. And if you look at all movements, who, who the most active people in it anyway? And we get lethargic. Yeah. You know, we get, and I can understand it too because we know more about the, the trauma than we knew before. I can understand it. I really can. But use them condoms. Get on that prep. <laughs> Please and thank you so that you're here to be able to do the work. Find out if you have the virus. If you do, you can live your whole great life undetectable and, and you'll just be fine. But I have to squeeze that on in here. But it is true. The Akron Ohio is full of LGBTQ plus plus folks that have been in the work and have fought like we are. I would love to just do a whole like day and symposium of meeting one of the greatest activists that I ever knew, Candy Carter. Yeah. Taught me about what was happening in Akron and I have family here and I did not know that. And we were here all the time. I didn't even know. But there's that too. Look up, look up and, and highlight these people. That's what you do, just tell people about these people. Do not accept the little bit of history that you get. And do not accept, oh, there's nobody like me, there's nobody here, there's nobody. Yes, we are here. Yes, you have a deep history and it, it's your job really. It's, it's really your job to make sure because erasing all of that is how we get where we're at. It, exactly. How we can really like sit. Like I, as a person that really worked, Roe v. Wade, I can't believe that. I can't believe, no matter how I feel about the Capitol, I can't believe that, and I'm gonna say it out loud. I can't believe it. I wept. I did too. I wept. I did too. Never in my life on this land. And yet the people I were teaching, hmm, upset, but not really knowing how upsetting that was. You know? And these laws that are coming on down, like, I can't believe it. You need your voice. If all you do is once a week write a letter to whomever, do that. Make a meme about whatever that lifts us up, do that. If you're looking at your friend groups and they look just like you, do something about it. It's gonna be uncomfortable. Get uncomfortable. That's what I would say. You need to get uncomfortable if you want to be a part of the change. And if you don't, please get the hell out of the way. Like really, mm -hmm. that, that's, you know, that's as strong as I'm gonna say it, cause I'm old, I am. I'm, I, this body is really starting to uh, catch up with me. <laughs> and this standing out in the cold uh, with hard shoes on is not. This hip hitches up, y'all have to carry me out of there. And I need some folks to, 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 to refresh us. Is that it? I don't know how much time, what, what time is, does anybody know what time it is? I don't know. We have what? Okay, can we skip to, yeah. Anyone? I'll make them short. <laughs> no, I got tall. Danny, there's a the second question on your card I would really like you to ask. Capital yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why do I use a capital S? Yeah. Um 
because I'm spectacular. <laughs> uh, and I'm shiny. And the S, my birth name is Sheila. Um, S-H-E-I-L-A. I changed it. Uh, I was going through some changes. I had gotten into kind of numerology and vibrations. And I all think that's all part of the creator's work and helping us understand things. And the way that Sheila was spelled um, did not have a good vibration and, and went with what was going on in my life. Friend came back from Wales, um, which si the singleton name actually originates there. We are probably pulling the rocks or something. But, <laughs> um, but um, she spelled Sheila, S-I-L-E. And so I used that for years, and I will say, whether it was psychosomatic or not, once I changed my name to that and people started using that, things change different for, for me. Um, and so that S is a nod to myself. I've always liked, liked my name and I liked my initials. And, um, but luster just fit. That's a whole long other story, but um, luster just, I started using this luster and the S, I, it's just a nod to that I'm, it's all of me. And that, that's kind of where I begin. And I can say, and I've always loved the P, you know, and my name, because it's just perfect and positive. <laughs> and so that's what that S, when people ask, I'll just say, sometimes special, star. It's a reminder, you know, of, of what I need to remember about myself to keep this light. Oh, Noah's got a question. How do you believe that younger generations are going to have their own fight for equity and equality? Oh, I'm inspired, the things that I see, uh, especially what's happening in high schools. Like, people are coming out of high school, I mean, like, sophomores and stuff, like, really organizing and um, standing up. It, you know, things cycle. Uh, if, if you just look at history, mm -hmm. it cycles. So it's about y'all's time, you know, to write, like, like that's what it is. What I love is the uh, multiplicity of it. What I love is that people are really, um, especially since the kind of Black Lives Matters kind of rises up, and then there's all these people saying, oh, hell no, though, but you're not going to leave us trans folks and us queer folks out of this. Last time we did that, last time we lost, walked alongside and we're like, yo, but this, this time, no, you're not. You're not leaving us out. And, you know, we have uh, uh, folks in disability uh, um, legislation and politics and work going, oh, but you're not going to leave us out why you all are doing that. And what is inspiring me, to me is that young folks are considering that. They aren't saying, well, hold on hold on while we do this part, and then we'll bring you all along. Because what do we know about that? It didn't work, Jesse Jackson, the Rainbow Coalition. It didn't work. We have to have people there in the beginning. We cannot add them on. We have to have them in the beginning, and that is what is so inspiring and empowering to me, is to see you all do that, and to, um, hear you all demanding that your voices be heard. That is, and that it's, it's, the, it's not performative. Uh, yes, there's the rallies and whatnot, but you're actually going to city council. You're actually uh, uh, joining neighborhood associations and realizing that the civic duty is, the, the, your civic obligations or where it all happens. All the thankless little jobs, the eldermen post, and all of those thankless jobs, the people that work the polls, we're seeing young folks start picking that back up. If you really want to learn about what's going on in your neighborhood, work the polls, honey. Dave, well, you will learn 
so much about who are the movers and shakers and what's really going on if you work the polls. Plus, you get paid for it. But, you know, but it, I would inspire um, or you all to, to do that. That is what I love that I'm seeing young folks get into politics. I do not appreciate the kind of ageism that's going on, though, that, and, and this booting out of old people. Like, I get the old white men thing. I get that. And it's the same. I worry about the cancel culture. I worry about just something about you I don't like, so I'm going to cancel mm -hmm. you completely out. I'm not going to give you an opportunity to learn. I will tell you that, yeah, you're that way because you're ignorant, but I won't give you any right. way. I cannot. That drives me insane. You know, all of one thing doesn't work. It does not work. We have to work for change, not exchange change not exchange we don't need to just get all of this people and push them out and get these people we are eons butt up against each other we need all of it to actually operate and that's my word on that thank you all very much <laughs> i appreciate it, I appreciate it.